next up is Eugene Silverstein. And um, Eugene, please correct me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so he, he is our next speaker in this um, in the series of new strategies for, sustain for sustainability and resilient cooling, and is the director of technical education and standards of the HVAC Excellence and ESCO Group. Um, Mr. Silverstein has over 35 years of experience in the HVAC and refrigeration industry, and he's worked in education as an instructor, professor, program coordinator, and department chair. And he's worked as a field technician as well, system designer, administrator, consultant, and is the author and co-author of several textbooks. So in this session, Eugene is going to discuss how inverter technology has taken the heat pumps of the previous generation and transformed them into dynamic, highly efficient and effective systems with load matching capabilities. So with that, I'll hand it over to Eugene. Thank you, Laura, and, and thanks to the Best Center for giving me the opportunity to, to spend some time with you today. Uh, yeah, the, the, the time that we have is quite limited, but I, I did want to, you know, take a step back to the, to the technical level of where we're at. And the, the, the whole concept of inverters is really important for us to teach our students that are going through vocational and technical training programs. So I wanted to, to take this time to really talk about some of the challenges that our industry has faced with older generation heat pump systems, uh, why people typically don't like heat pump systems, and then transition really quickly to, to why heat pump systems are so efficient and, and how inverters work. And when we talk about variable refrigerant flow systems, we're really, really talking about variable fluid flow systems because the inverter technology has found its way into pretty much every aspect of, of our industry from, from domestic water heating to radiant heating systems to radiant cooling systems. Our uh, fossil fuel heating systems are relying on inverter controlled pumps and delivery systems. Uh, in our mini splits, uh, mini splits could not have reached the popularity that they have right now without the inverter technology. So although we're talking about variable refrigerant flow systems, it really is a variable fluid flow situation and inverters are the, the key to that. And just very briefly, I mean, older generation heat pumps back when I entered the industry, over 40 years ago, thanks to Laura for saying 35, just made me feel five years younger. But we were we were dealing with single speed compressors, single speed fans, single capacity systems. They were either all on or all off. So we experienced frequent starts and stops. And, and as we know, the vast majority of energy is consumed when these systems uh, start up, primarily our our compressors. So there were a lot of challenges with early generation heat pump systems, and some of these challenges we still continue to face today. And they revolve around improper system sizing, installation charging, and unrealistic expectations of the end user. So that really revolves around educating the users of the equipment. For example, if somebody, uh, and I'll throw out a residential application, let's say somebody lived in a house and they had a gas fired furnace, and then they downsized and moved to a condo without a heat pump, the, the temperature of the supply air being delivered to the space was a lot lower than what they expected. So people were thinking that the heat pump system was not working or when a heat pump system went into defrost and the air was being tempered. Again, the user or the occupant of the space might feel that the, the heat pump system wasn't working when cool air was being introduced to the space. So these were some of the challenges and going back to the, uh, you know, the improper sizing and installation, you know, back when I lived in, in New York, we designed systems, a heating system for a 15 degree outside ambient temperature with a design indoor temp of 70 and, you know, with a heating temperature difference of 55 degrees, whereas our cooling temperature difference was, was only 10. So, if there were any deficiencies in the sizing or installation of my system, 
it wouldn't really become evident in the cooling mode because my system was only pushing against a 10 degree delta T. Well, those deficiencies in the system became more evident when I ran that system in the heating mode as we were now pushing heat against 55 degrees. So these systems developed a bad reputation of, of not working. So it's really, really important that our systems be properly installed, designed, maintained, but the, the underlying concept of a heat pump system it is really, really dynamic. And with the introduction and the, uh, you know, the advancement in inverter control technology really, really uh, brings that to the next level. So if we're looking at a, at a, at the pressure enthalpy diagram of a heat pump system, we can basically see that when we're operating in the cooling mode, the cost of cooling is basically made up by our suction line, which in this diet in this pressure enthalpy diagram is from point C to D and from our compressor, the, the compression of heat from D to E, whereas the benefit of that cooling is obtained from our net refrigeration effect, which is from points B to C, which is our evaporator. So in the cooling mode, we could see that the cost of cooling is separate from the, the actual cooling effect that we're getting. Now, in the heating mode, the, the cost of cooling, the cost of operating that compressor, our heat of compression that's being generated, that heat that's being concentrated and absorbed from the compressor motor is actually translating into the heating benefit that we're getting. As you can see in this diagram, the, the discharge line and the our condenser coil, which is in the heating mode is our indoor coil, is identified between points A and E on this chart. So we're actually double dipping where, you know, we have to spend the energy to compress the refrigerant to create the pressure difference that is going to facilitate refrigerant flow through the system. But we're also benefiting from that heat as it directly translates it into the, you know, into our heating benefit. So as we as we move into inverter control technology, we're really using a variety of inputs and, and different strategies to determine the optimal refrigerant pressures, the, the saturation pressures and temperatures that are gonna best suit the needs of that system. So instead of having a system that's constantly cycling on and off as traditional heat pump systems did, we are now able to, to load match we're actually able to produce the cooling or heating effect that the system requires. And when I'm teaching my students, I always like to show them this little graphic and, and there's a, a little red car and that car is sitting at a, at a traffic light and that traffic light happens to be red. And, and the way our traditional heat pump systems work or even traditional air conditioning systems work, the instant that light turns green, the user of the vehicle steps on the gas pedal, floors it, and arrives at the next traffic light. And then once that next traffic light turns green, boom, the user is flooring it again. And this is actually what happens with our traditional air conditioning and heat pump systems. The system is either on or off, and it's constantly starting and stopping, starting and stopping. And again, the, you know, the constant starting is where we are using excessive amounts of energy. Well, the inverter control concept really relies on the fact that as our motors, and we'll talk about compressors specifically, as these compressors speed up, the pressure on the low side drops and the pressure on the high side rises, as you can see in the top of this. And as that compressor slows down, our low side pressure rises and our high side pressure drops. So what happens is, as I speed this compressor up, that pressure enthalpy chart is going to change. So what we're gonna see is our high side pressure rises and our low side pressure is dropping. Now, what made traditional heat pumps so inefficient in the heating mode was their ability to absorb heat from the outside air decreased as well as their ability to discharge warm air to the occupied space. 
So by speeding up our compressors and by dropping that low side pressure, it's now lowering the temperature of the evaporator coil, which is the outdoor coil. And if the outside coil is colder, it's going to be able to absorb more heat into the refrigerant. And consequently, as the high side pressure rises, it is going to, the refrigerant's gonna be able to impart more heat to the air in the conditioned space. Now, one of the things is, yes, if you look at this chart, you could see that points D and E, which is that heart, the slanted line from, you know, going up and to the right, that represents our compressor. So there's definitely more energy being used to facilitate this change in temperature, this increase in high side pressure and low side and decrease in the low side. But the heat that's generated during that compression process is directly being translated and transferred to the refrigerant that is ultimately heating the air in our space. So as we deal with the inverters, these high side and low side pressures can change accordingly to match the system's needs. So getting back to our example with our, our car, all right, when that light turns green, yes, our red car, that he's gone and he's up at that next light. But the blue car represents our inverter control compressor, easing off the gas pedal, easing off the brake, easing down on the gas pedal, nice even uh, flow. So this way, by the time that car reaches the next light, that light turns green and uh, the car can, can continue. So it's the speed of the motor that is affecting the operating pressures in our in our system. So I want to spend the rest of our time, which is very brief. I'm, I'm going to go through these rel this relatively quickly, but I do want to uh, let you know that that should you want these slides for your for your students, I will make them available afterwards. But there are there are a number of factors that that uh, contribute to motor speed. We have motor speed is in rotations per minute. So we have 60 seconds per minute, all right? And there are 60 cycles per second in an AC power supply, all right? Canceling out like terms. In an AC power supply, we have uh, two polarity changes per cycle. And finally, we have this factor of rotations per polarity change. And with those rotations per polarity change, which we'll talk about, then we end up with our rotations per minute. Now, 60 seconds per minute, we can change that. Last time I checked, there were 60 seconds per minute. There will always be 60 seconds per minute. On an AC power supply, there are two polarity changes per cycle. And rotations per polarity change relates to the number of poles on a motor. A two-pole motor is a two-pole motor. A four-pole motor is a four-pole motor. So we don't have control over three of those four uh, factors that make up our motor speed, but we do have control over the frequency. That's 60 cycles per second. And we're going to take a look at that in a second. So very briefly, we have two stationary magnets and we have one magnet that is held in place between those two. If we, re if we remove the pressure holding that magnet in place, that magnet is going to rotate 180 degrees until the north poles and south poles align with each other. So having two poles, every time we change the polarity, these motors or this magnet will rotate one half of a revolution. So with two poles, I get half of a rotation per polarity change or one rotation for every two polarity changes. As the number of poles changes, every time we change the polarity on our motor, the magnet or rotor on the motor will change one quarter of a turn. So as the number of poles increases, the number, the amount of rotation we get per polarity change decreases. So on a four pole motor, we get one quarter of a rotation per polarity change. So the rotations per polarity change is actually the inverse of the number of poles our motor has. So if we look at this formula, we have 60 seconds per minute times 60 cycles per second times two polarity changes per cycle. 
when we divide that by the number of poles, that's going to give us our synchronous motor speed for a standard motor. So if we have a two pole motor, we have a synchronous motor speed of 3600 RPMs. All right, a four pole motor, 1800. But how can we change the frequency of our power supply? And on the left, we have a, a standard AC sine wave. And we're going to pass that sine wave through uh, a bridge rectifier at, with made up of four diodes and an output across that resistor in the middle. And we could see that during the positive cycle, the direction of current flow through that center resistance is from right to left. And then in the second half, it's also from right to left. So although the input is a sine wave, the output is a rectified sine wave. So we're basically flipping the polarity of that second half of the sine wave. Once we get that wave, we then pass it through a bank of capacitors, and then we get that smooth. So we're basically taking that single AC power supply and we're converting it to a DC, more or less a constant. The larger these capacitors, the smoother that output form is going to be. And then finally, we're gonna pass it through a transistor bank. And our six transistors here, labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, one and four contribute to one single sine wave, two and five contribute to a single as do three and six. And as we apply voltage to each of those transistors at one, two, three, four, five, six, we're gonna either open or close the path for electric current to take. So what happens with this is as we cycle on, so for example, transistor one is gonna turn on at time zero, and it's going to be on for a period of time, then we're gonna turn it off, and then we're gonna turn on transistor four, all right? And it is gonna operate in the negative direction. The same thing's gonna happen with the other transistors. And by smoothing that out, we now have artificial three phase that we are going to be able to to control. So what happens is we have a set of instructions where we are turning these transistors on or off to conduct or not conduct electricity. And as we increase or decrease the time interval between these instructions, turning transistors on or off, we're able to increase or decrease the frequency. So if the time interval between the starting and stopping or the turning on and turning off of these transistors decreases, the frequency of our signal increases and the motor is going to, to speed up. And similarly, if the time interval between these instructions increases, the frequency of the signal is going to decrease and the motor is going to slow down. So it, it's really, really important. And this can be used again for for pumps, for compressors, for fans. And, and this basic technology is the same concept behind variable frequency drives, your electronically commutated motors. And again, it's being used throughout our industry. And as Nihar mentioned earlier, I mean, it, it's all about you know, the efficiency and yes, refrigerants, but also the actual mechanics of the systems are changing. And if you looked at the, the chart that Nihar presented to you before, you could see that the variable speed systems had were more expensive, but those costs are coming down. But those are the systems that are more toward the right of his chart, showing that they are much more efficient because we're eliminating the constant starting and stopping where these systems are able to ramp up or ramp down to match the load of the system. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thanks to the Best Center. I will be at the HVAC Excellence and ESCO booth uh, following this right up until 11 o'clock Pacific. So if you have questions uh, past now, feel free to uh, to ask. Thank you, Eugene. Um, we do have a, a few questions that came in. The first is, how many heat pumps are in service in the US? Oh, I do not have that number handy, but pretty much I mean, every mini split right now that's that's being sold you know is in effect a heat pump system so the number is definitely growing and the, the i mean the older generations again don't like heat pumps and that was a major major concern but as as contractors 
become more comfortable with the technology and they recommend these systems to their customers, the number is definitely going to increase. But I, I don't have a number about how many are in service right now. And Sorry, a related question by chance, do you, do you happen to know how many heat pumps are installed annually? I, I in do not. Okay. Um, how about, what about refrigerant additives that reduce fouling and increase heat transfer? I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the question is there. Well, I, um, I personally and, and believe that there should only be two things flowing through a, ref, a refrigerant system, and that's refrigerant and oil. So again, I'm a little old school. I've been in the industry for, for over 40 years. I, I am not a fan of any additives, you know, into a system. And again, if, if something's being added to a system, you know, it, it, it really needs to be tested by manufacturer to manufacturer, whether it's safe for their system. Personally, I'm not a fan of adding any foreign substances to, to an HVAC system. Um, let's, let's see, there's a question that says, that asks, um, how do you see cold climate heat pumps becoming more popularized? Well, you know, in, in cold climates, I actually spoke with a, with an HVAC instructor and he is in Anchorage, Alaska, and they have a whopping four cooling hours per year. And he is actually teaching heat pumps in his program. And that might be a little extreme. But with with the concept of inverters, as these compressors speed up, the like I said, the, the low side pressure, that evaporator coil temperature is dropping. So it's able to absorb heat in colder climates. Even even in New York, where I was born and raised, we we didn't like heat pumps. We had the mentality that heat pumps don't work. But on Long Island, heat pumps are are all the rage. People are putting them in. And even as the outside temperatures are dropping, they're they're able to meet the the heating needs of the, you know, of the space. Now, as you get further and further north, I guess their appeal might wane a little bit, but but manufacturers now are are really really you know I mean they're putting information out where they're reaching efficiencies that are that are very very high and being able to meet the needs in colder climates. I don't know how cold we're, we're talking, but the the that magic line where heat pumps air quote work and don't work is definitely rising north. We are um, a few minutes over, so I'm going to I'm going to shoot one more question over to you, Eugene, and that is in the Q&A, which is that currently R410 is used in heat pumps. Do you know where the next generation of refrigerants are going? Well, we're, we're definitely moving toward uh, our low GWP refrigerants. Nihar alluded to the uh, to the phase out of HCFCs. The you know R410A was intended to be a temporary replacement. So, fifty percent of R410A is R32. So we are seeing more, and R32 is very popular in Europe. So the, the refrigerants that we're going to be seeing moving forward are definitely going to be toward our low GWP, air quote, mildly flammable refrigerants. But there is a lot of uh, concern. But even R410A, that, you know, there, there's some information out there that says, well, you know, refrigerants can become flammable if they leak at uneven rates. But when manufacturers are testing these refrigerants and they test the R410A, for example, they test that over a very wide range of leak rates. And to get an A1 safety classification, which is what R410A has, it has to prove to be non-flammable even at excessive leak rates of either component of the refrigerant. So yeah, we're gonna see new refrigerants coming out there, but when I say new refrigerants, these aren't refrigerants that haven't been here. You know, R290 is our propane. You know, R32 is a is a 50% component of R410A. So we hear a lot about new refrigerants, but these refrigerants have been around for quite some time. Eugene, thank you so much. I just want to echo uh, what I'm hearing in so many of these comments, which is that 
this is a, you have a, a great and unique ability of making complex things simple. And um, this is a really great presentation that that's that helped also explain inverter operation. And so um, it seems like this is widely appreciated. Thank you so much. For I appreciate your time the time. Laura, thank you so much. And like I said, I will be at the HVAC excellence booth right after this. But but thank you for the kind words. It's uh, it's something I try and pride myself on trying to make it you know make the make the content accessible for for everybody. Um, my theory has always been for teachers: if a teacher doesn't know it, they can't teach it. If a teacher doesn't teach it, our students can't learn it. If our students don't learn it, they can't do it. Certainly, your instructor background is is coming through, and so we <laughs> definitely appreciate that. Um, yes, and I definitely encourage everybody to to head over to the to Eugene's booth after this chat, and also stay tuned for the um, the next session at ten thirty with the, another LVNL speaker, Ian Walker, who will talk about paths to residential decarbonization. So thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great day.